right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from beautiful blue sky San Diego. And today I'm joined by Tracy Grove, who's up in Redmond, Washington. How are you doing, Tracy? I'm doing great. How are you doing, John? Great, uh, great as well. And Tracy founded Pure Symmetry with the mission to help people and organizations thrive. Organizations thrive. And today we're going to talk about something interesting, taming the saber tooth. And who doesn't want to know how to tame a saber tooth in case one uh, leaps upon you metaphorically. So resilient leadership in a stressful world. So four ways that leaders can deal with ambiguity and change with courage and grace and help their teams thrive in times of change. So let's face it, we couldn't be in a more challenging period of time right now. And uh, I think uh, dealing with ambiguity and change with courage and grace, that's a big ask for a lot of people. So, so how, can, how can people do that? Well, it's, um, it's, it's one of those things that I've found consistently with people who've gone through some difficult times or some sense of trauma, it does help them to build the resilience muscle, if you like. But I learned through my research that you can actually build this muscle regardless of the situation that you're in. So the, the whole purpose behind the book was to help people understand that it is a muscle that you can build. You can shift your mindset to being more optimistic regardless of the circumstances. And often, as is the case right now, you can't necessarily do anything about your circumstances. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. something you can control, but you can control your response to those circumstances. And that's the gist of the whole, of the whole premise of the book is to teach skills and, to, and to, give, to give people a set of tools and resources to enable them to build those skills regardless of what's happening in their lives. And as you said, right now is one of the most challenging times that I think we're going through as a humanity um, in, 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 any, in any sense of our history. So um, it's, it's a very timely, uh, I think, uh, approach now to be thinking about how you shore up your mindset and how you actually focus on optimism despite the situation. Yeah, and I love in your book and the introduction is called Hiding Behind a Rock is Not an Option because I, I mean, I guess right now that it's very tempting to hide behind rocks, um, but that's not an option. No, and unfortunately, it's one of those things that as humans, you know, we're, it's wired into us. We either, well, I call it the fight, flight, f freeze mm -hmm. syndrome. So it's like there's three sections to it. So we either learn to fight it out, and it, this can be often because of our history or, or even our personality, or we might want to, we just, we might become frozen and paralyzed and unable to move forward or even think about how we can address the situation. Um, but what, what often happens is that we flee. We want to, mm -hmm. we want to run and hide behind a rock. So, you know, that, that was the way we used to, we used to operate when we were running around with real saber tooths chasing mm -hmm. us. Um, that those were our options. And generally you couldn't fight the saber tooth because it was going to win that, that particular mm -hmm. argument. Um, you know, you could, you could try and outrun it, but it was unlikely that that was going to happen. Um, and if you froze, well, then playing dead could be either very detrimental to your health or could maybe save you. <laughs> but the, the, there wasn't really an option that was feasible for us as humans. Unfortunately, now that we're facing, you know, not necessarily always physical threats, although COVID mm -hmm. obviously has an element of that too for a lot of people, but it's largely a psychological threat that yeah. we're dealing with. And when we're dealing with this, our brains still see it as a physical threat. So we go into this fight, flight, freeze mentality. And that's what locks us up or gets us into a space where we just spiral into a, a dark place. And we really just want to hide and, you know, put the duvet over our heads and, and tell the world to go away. And that's, mm -hmm. a, that's completely understandable and completely human. Unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily help you to move through a situation. Yeah, and, and I love where in your, in your first chapter you say life and work takes courage because I think it's a very powerful statement to make because we live in a culture today, unfortunately, where I call it the shortcut culture, the everything should be easy, everything should be fun, there shouldn't be, you know, and if there's, if there's a challenge in front of you, well, you look at this go, well, somebody needs to take care of this because I'm supposed to be having a wonderful time. And, and I think people have lost the in many ways that the, the understanding that, as you say, life and work is hard. I mean, you know, work is hard and life is hard and it takes courage to excel and to meet challenges head on. It does. And, you know, the reality is much, uh, much as, you know, some generations now would hate to hate to believe it, the world doesn't owe you anything. 
yeah. and, you know anything that anything that you achieve is 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 purely as a response to the, the, the amount of effort that you put in and i think one of the problems and i, I do have a, a quiet rant about this in the book <laughs> is that we we accommodate uh, the, the you know this, this this new generation that's coming up we accommodate them too much I and so. you know you have the helicopter parents coming in you've, you've all seen the scandals with people buying college degrees for their children that kind of thing getting them into the right schools you know you even have have parents who are intervening when their children don't do well enough in in exams um, and it's not a lesson that the ch child learns as you know work harder knuckle down do the best you can you're not always going to win that's mm -hmm. okay as long as you've done the best that you possibly can. Instead, they learn that somebody's going to take care of the problem for me. And they yes. unfortunately are then very ill-equipped to deal with the challenges of the real world. So when they come up against a challenge, they, they, they literally just implode. And, you know, millennials are yeah. one of the most depressed populations out there. And yeah. I think now looking at the next generation that's coming up, they're not, they're not far behind. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's really a sense of, and there's, there's a sense of self entitlement, unfortunately, which has been um, yeah, is disadvantaging these this, this generation because the parents and and teachers are are not allowing them to fall down, learn, and pick themselves up. You know, I always talk about embracing epic failure. You have to fail in order to grow. Like they're called mm -hmm. growing pains for a reason. Yeah. You know, People don't want, they don't want their children. And it's understandable. Parents want the best for their children. But unfortunately, it's a disservice. Because oh, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible, it's a horrible disservice. And, uh, and I, I think I, I always fall back on a number of examples, you know, from my own life that I look at. It, it's, it's like I, when, when my son was very small, uh, he played soccer for a little bit. And I, I was a coach in this soccer league when we lived over in, in Northern Virginia. And... I got into trouble for teaching the kids to tackle and it, because it, and they had it because it was supposed to be set up as a non-contact sport right and i said i said okay but at what point do you actually tell them that that's not true that it actually is a contact sport and um, do you do it when they're eight when they're 10 when they're 15 when do they find that out and i feel the same way about life it's like if everybody always gets a, middle, a medal, if nobody ever loses, if you never have faced consequences, at what point do you let your kids know that actually you've been lying to them all along and life isn't like that? Right. And, and unfortunately, generally, when they do find that out, it's, it's, it's a horrible shock. Yeah, it's traumatic. And, and it, it, it can render people completely incapable and it can completely break them. So they're, they're, yeah. you know, instead, of, instead of teaching the self-esteem and you know, you, need, you know, everyone gets a medal for showing up, and and nobody, you know, they don't do exams because they don't want anyone to feel yeah. like they're less less good as somebody else, or you know, valedictorians are being done away with because you mm -hmm. know, heaven forbid somebody should be better than my child. It's just yeah. unfortunate because the reality is somebody is better always. That's just yeah. there's going to be somebody who's better, faster, quicker, more smarter, and that, that and that's okay. It doesn't diminish the achievements of the individual at all just because somebody else might be better at it. But unfortunately, yeah. it's just this whole, this whole notion of, you know, self in this, this entitlement. And as you said, you, you, you used a very good word, you know, there's, there's a lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lack of taking responsibility for our actions. And so there's a passive helplessness that's almost ingrained in society now. It's almost yeah. as if, well, you know what, we just have to, we just have to sit here and, and, and accept that, you know, if, if, if something isn't working well, it's somebody else's fault. It's somebody mm -hmm. else's problem. I can't do anything. I'm the victim because yeah. I'm, it's a very yeah. comfortable place to play the victim. It's a very comfortable place. And, uh -huh. uh, and, and I do think there's a couple of things that I just wanted to comment on that. And one of us, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm big into martial arts and do martial arts. And I, yeah, and it's one of, it's one of my uh, passions. And in martial arts, uh, there will always be somebody bigger, stronger. There'll always be somebody who is a, a master or a grandmaster. It's always going to be people better than you. What martial arts teaches you is to compete with yourself. 
-hmm. is to see how you can you can be a you can be better than you were the day before than the year before that you can always progress and it's never about measuring yourself against the other people mm -hmm. you look up and you admire the other people you think that's fantastic now how can i continue to improve and i think that's what's lacking is you know instead of dumbing everything down it's like no you're competing with yourself and if you want to reach those levels then you need to push yourself and the other thing that you mentioned is the accountability thing this is something that drives me crazy but also i always say to people that the minute you take full responsibility for your circumstances in your life is such a liberating experience because no longer as you say are you sitting there going there's nothing i can do it's the world's fault and i'm the victim now you're saying yeah, maybe I'm in a crappy situation right now, but what did I do to get myself into this situation? And why am I staying in this situation? And, and instead of looking for reasons to blame other people, I mean, there's always circumstances for sure. But when you say, I, I take accountability, I'm here. And however I got myself here, I'm here. And now I'm going to get myself out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We always play a role in whatever our circumstances are. Sure. And yeah. it may be a big or a small role, depending on the circumstances, for sure. But there is a role that we play. And, you know, this this whole notion of locus of control, of having this mm -hmm. mentality of it's either outward, outward facing, um, you know, everyone else is, you know, I, I didn't do well in an exam, for example. Well, it's, it's the teacher's fault or the exam was too hard or I didn't mm -hmm. have time to study versus well, I didn't do that well in this exam right now, um, but you know what, I'll do better next time. I'll learn yeah. from this experience. Maybe I'll spend more time studying. Maybe I'll, I'll focus, I'll learn from, from what I, I found difficult this time around. And, but, but it's within my control to change the situation. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about resilience is it is with everything is a choice. We make yeah. a choice. And unfortunately, choices have repercussions and choices have, have um, um, outcomes that may or may not work for us. But that is, that is the choice that we've made. And so we have to take responsibility for that choice. And that's where I talk about, you know, choosing your distractions. You know, mm. we're, we're in a world of so much noise and so much distraction. Oh. And oh, social media is just a dark hole that you really don't mm -hmm. want to go into. Yeah. But, but, you know, and, and especially now for people who are stuck at home, a lot of them, and who are, um, you know, largely using up all of the commute time all the time that they had before to separate between work and life is being sucked into a working environment and they're stuck on a, a you know attached to a screen um, there's a, so much information and so much data coming at them and even just doing online meetings is cognitively mm -hmm. a huge load for people um, you know there's 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 this notion of well you, you distractions are always going to be there you have a choice to choose the distractions where do you want to spend your time and your energy and so, you know, I, I, I try very hard to help my clients to separate themselves from the screen, even though, you know, they're even more attached to a screen now than they have been in the past. Yeah. Like, you know, step away, step away, put, in, insert those breaks into your day that help you to then just, just yeah. cognitively disconnect and just recharge your batteries. Because I think that it's, yeah. it's very depleting for people. It is. And... And, and to your point, it's like, choose the inputs into your brain, for goodness sake, because if right. you, and I always say, I mean, if you start off your day with the news, right, and there's no such thing as news anymore, because it's not news, right. it's just designed to provoke you, and it right. doesn't matter which side of the spectrum you sit on, your news is just designed to provoke a reaction in you. Social yep. media is designed to provoke a reaction. Often it's, it's the comparison culture, oh dear, oh dear, Tracy looks like she's having a much better life than me, I'm depressed now. So you can start off your day with so much negativity in your brain, it's like, would you start off your day eating you know get up for breakfast and say okay i'm gonna have chocolate cake and big macs for breakfast you know you wouldn't because you'd say okay that's i'm putting junk into my body well you're putting junk into your brain and then you're wondering why you're feeling depressed and lethargic throughout the day absolutely and and to, to a large extent then just frustrated as well because you're not getting done what you want to get done yeah. so you know you're not focusing on the right things because this you know and there's this whole fear of missing out culture as well and we're such yeah. a selfie generation yeah. I mean, the self-obsession narcissistic generation is just it's out of control i've never seen anything like it <laughs> you know, no one really cares if you're you no. know brushing your teeth this morning i i really don't need to, to see that don't don't need to mm. know so you know there's this there's this whole inward facing and it, it comes it, it also is connected to this whole notion of you know um lack of accountability and responsibility mm -hmm. but it's all about look at me 
And yeah. it comes from a place of such insecurity. And what's interesting is that if you start to look out versus look in, and you start to think about, well, how, you know, who are you grateful for in your life? What are the things that you appreciate? What are the good things that are happening to you? If you start looking out and you start to look at the, the ordinary things in your life and start to see them through the eyes that say, these are actually mm -hmm. extraordinary things. Yes. I mean, the fact that, you know, we, we're, we're the majority of us, you know, are, are sitting in our houses and, you know, can, can work online. That's, that's, that's remarkable. Yeah. We, despite the fact that we're going through a pandemic right now. You know, there's, there's a lot of things to be very grateful for and very optimistic for, but you have to look out to see them. Mm -hmm. Because if you're looking in and it's all about focusing on me and the sort of selfie generation, it's a very selfish mindset it, that comes from it, that. And there's a lack of appreciation for anything other than me. And so that's where you know, I often tell my clients to think about, you know, practice gratitude, thinking about what, what, is, what is working for you. Three amazing things that happen to you every day. Write mm -hmm. them down. And people are often saying to me, well, this is ridiculous. I, nothing happened mm -hmm. today. It was an awful day. I'm like, really? What happened? Well, I got out of bed. I'm like, you wait, you have a bed? Yes. Like, yeah. Everything? Wow. And you had the amazing. energy and you had the energy and the physical capability to get out of it. Yeah. Out of bed, exactly. So, you know, you start to shift the mindset to look at the ordinary that's part of your life. And, you know, whether you, you, you know, living the life you want to or not is irrelevant. There are still good things in your life. There are good people, people who've done things for you, who you appreciate. If you focus on that, it actually shifts. It creates neurological pathways in your brain to a more optimistic mindset. So you, you, it starts to buffer you against that horrible social media, up with social comparison, everyone's got a perfect mm. life. They don't, it's fake. None of, yeah. it, none, none of the stuff on social media is real. Uh, and by the way, everything in magazines is Photoshop. There's, there's nothing yeah. that's, that's really exactly. out there. It's a exactly. Smoking. And yeah. so I think, I think that's, that's, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a, an attachment to something that's completely not real that is mm -hmm. um, sucking the energy and the life out of people. And when they and, focus on what they really have, it's, it, it grounds them in something that's real and is good. Mm -hmm. And the point, the point that you're making here, which I think is incredibly, incredibly important, is the fact that uh, all of these things are not making you feel good. I mean, that's the thing, they're not making you feel good. But what you say about choosing optimism, as you said, is like even looking at the fact that I woke up today in a nice bed, in a nice house, in a nice place, and I was physically capable of getting out of bed. And guess what? When I went downstairs, there was food in the, cu in the cupboard and I was able to have the breakfast that I wanted to have. And then yes. I was able to come to all these things. And you're going, that's a very, that's a very uplifting and optimistic. If you mm -hmm. go and spend your time on social media, you've got, to, you've got to start asking yourself, how does that make me feel? And what is it communicating to other people? Because if you and I, if I, if I met you for, for lunch, and we start talking and then immediately I have my phone out and I'm taking a picture of my lunch or I'm selfie myself. I'm in this restaurant. What am I saying to you? I'm just saying, yeah, listen, Trace, it's nice to have lunch with you. But to be honest, you're not as important as these people who I've never met before. <laughs> exactly. And, and, there's, and there's, so there's also this whole notion of, you know, we, we, we are unfortunately are, have a very short attention span. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they, a few years ago, it was a seven second attention span. Yeah. Now we have the attention span of a goldfish. It's three seconds. Yeah. That's what I, I actually, I actually read somewhere that it's below a goldfish. So we have officially crossed over from evolution <laughs> into de-evolution. So we're actually headed backwards now. <laughs> oh, I, I, I have no doubt of it whatsoever. And part of it is this, no, this multitasking. You know, this mm -hmm. whole fear of missing out. I have to be doing all these things. It's what, it's what drives people to think that for some reason, they're different to everyone else and they can actually text and drive. Not mm. a problem. It's yeah. not possible. Your brain cannot multitask. It's physically impossible. You're switch tasking and it takes yeah, time. It's exactly like your brain's going down a track, right? So you, you switch from one train, one track to the next track. That takes cognitive load and it takes, it takes a, a, a second to just switch over, but it's very tiring. It makes mm -hmm. the work that you're doing so much more difficult. And frankly, it's, it's incredibly um, taxing on your brain. And it dumps us down. We, you know, we lose eight IQ points whenever we multitask. We literally yeah. become stupid. It's crazy. But people think they can do it all the time because every, I'm different, yeah. right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, as I, I always call it, I always say it's not multi. It's, it, multitasking is doing a lot of things badly at one time. 
exactly. Well, it's failing at, at multiple yeah. things at once, right? <laughs> so, and but, but to your point as well, this whole notion of you know not paying attention, not being present for the people in your life. And I see this all the time on calls. I, you know, especially now with the Zoom thing, you know, you, you see people and it's harder for them potentially to be able to multitask because in the old days you could yeah. be on a call, no one could see yeah. you, you'd be hammering away on email, you know, doing whatever you're doing. Now you've got people who are being forced to be on video, which is a good thing. And you've got them trying to juggle children and pets <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. The, the washer guy and all the rest of it while doing calls while you know teaching a math class and so we're almost being forced into this multitasking um yeah. mindset if you like which is so so difficult on our brain which is why people are exhausted they're yeah. burnt out because they're trying to do so much more and they're trying to do it all on video and you know balance <laughs> with, with other people so there's a kind of empathy that comes from from people seeing what's going on in your world um, but but it, it's 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 almost like you know we've, we've gone from this you know I'm I'm going to disconnect from you because you're not that interesting and frankly I'm just more interesting, which yeah. was kind of a, more of a sort of a, a, a microaggression in some ways because it, it showed where you were in the hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. But now the technology and the way that we have to work is almost forcing us to be that way because mm -hmm. we have to split our attention between so many things and that's where it's such a challenge I think now, for yeah, people yeah. now to just hold on to to, to one thing for any and, any period of time and to be honest i mean to be to be authentic and to be polite just to be basic polite. i mean we, we're such a rude society today right oh. i mean i mean it's like i mean how often have you have you sat with somebody and you're talking to them and their phone beeps right with the message and you can see it in their face that they no longer care about what you're saying about they just want to grab the message and sometimes they'll they'll polite they will pseudo politely delay a few seconds and you can see they're pretending and then they go oh do you mind if I, I just need to look at this they're just pretending they had stopped listening to you the minute that thing dinged because that ding and it could have been a spam message for all they know is more important than whatever it is you're saying so we just become so yeah. rude and 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 and, 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 and 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 i'm not sure we're, we're not even i mean i'm not sure people are are conscious of how absolutely rude and ignorant they're being uh, and it's not it's not intentional i don't believe mm -hmm. i think it's just we've become like pavlov's dog the bell yeah. goes and we all <laughs> immediately have to yeah. see something like i always tell my clients switch off the toaster pop up on your machine if you're struggling with productivity yeah. mm -hmm. switch that off so that every time an email comes in you're not like pavlov's dog going to see what it is you know schedule time you know, again it comes down yeah. to choosing your distractions right schedule your time use your energy cycles if you have high energy in the morning that's where you tackle the tough tasks if you're more of an afternoon person great do them then but do the low brain power messy task of email and texts and all that stuff when you don't have the higher energy and do it in in in, in packets so that you you're able to actually look back on your day and go i got some stuff done which is, you know, most of us, you know, you, how, how many times do you open an email, close an email, open an email, close an email. You're like, I, I got nothing done today. And I'm like, okay, great. Why didn't you? Because I'm constantly reacting to alerts of something and, or other. And that's why I always, uh, I always advise people is to write down your to-do list every day. Actually physically write it down with a good old-fashioned pen and paper. And there has been research done that proves that when you write it down, you have a greater chance of doing it than if you put it on an electronic tickler or whatever. And, and the other part, I get a massive sense of accomplishment when I write, when I do the strike through of that item on my to-do <laughs> list, I think, because then I can look down and I can say, okay, there's a few things I didn't get done today, but there's seven things that was on my list that are now no longer on my list. And that's a great sense of accomplishment. And that may seem simplistic, but I guarantee you it's not. It, it will change your whole way of thinking. It'll, it'll be the difference between you leaving work happy and energized and leaving work depressed and lethargic. Exactly. And also, you know, when you can put that strike through, especially if you're at home now where, you know, work yeah. is, you know, the next room where you don't have the commute to go to. It's mm -hmm. almost like a physical a line that you put yes. in, in the sand to say i'm done with this now great and it almost gives you permission to step away yes. and actually then yeah. get, get on with the rest of your day and i think that's one of the things that i think people have to relearn the skill of separation between work and life because it's mm -hmm. become so merged together now that it's almost impossible to have that that 
feeling of, you know, I'm done. I, I did, did a good job because mm. it's always on to the next thing. And so I always invite mm. my clients to stop and look back and go, okay, how did that go? Did it go well? What did I learn? Great. Put a line under it. Now you can move on to the next thing or ideally if it's the end of the day, move, move on to actually spending time mm. with your family or yes. you know, for a lot of yeah. parents spending time with their, their kids. Yeah. So don't finish work and immediately get on social media. Don't immediately get on the news. Oh. Go do something that actually is, is positively stimulating. So listen, Tracy, yeah. this has been fantastic. The book is Taming the Saber Tooth, Resilient Leadership in a Stressful World. I see this lovely uh, quote from Gen General Stanley McChrystal there, retired four-star general on the top of it. Uh, Tracy has written a stimulating and insightful book with straightforward, actionable ways to become a resilient leader in today's fast paced world. And goodness knows we, we need a lot more of that, to be honest. Um, all of Tracy's information will be below this video, but before we go, Tracy, do please tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yes. So I am an executive coach. I've been coaching since 2008. That's when I started my business. Um, I was, I've spent all my life in corporate America um, and, and corporate South Africa and corporate England. Um, so, you know, a lot of experience in very uh, matrixed, complex environments, very um, competitive environments. And a lot of that came, uh, came into the book. Uh, lessons that I've learned along the way, both mm -hmm. as a leader myself, but also just observing other leaders. Um, and so the good, the bad, and the ugly is in the book. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's all kinds of examples in there. Um, just, just lessons that, that I've learned along the way, but also from coaching so many clients. Um, so I help a lot of leaders think about whether their teams are engaging well, whether they're showing up well as leaders, how to communicate more effectively, how to bring teams along to make them agile, more, more responsive, and much more resilient in a very, very stressful world. For a lot of businesses right now, it's a very, very tough time. So I work with clients to help them to work through that and help their teams to move together versus be scattered and be, um, have a lack of direction. So it's really about leadership development, resilience, um, and it, it's just an agile mindset. That's what I focus on with my clients and just helping them to be effective leaders and empathetic leaders in, in the workplace. So hopefully bring the soul back to the workplace, which is um, Alan Briskin, who wrote the foreword in my book, um, was, 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 he, he wrote um, uh, Bringing the Soul to Work. And that's the, that's the book that actually inspired me all those years ago to start coaching because I saw that the soul was being depleted and being destroyed um, in, in, in this, this modern corporate workplace. And I don't believe that that's what anybody wants. And I believe that people thrive in a workplace where they feel like they can be themselves and they can bring the best they have um, of themselves to the work every day. Yeah, no, love it. That's fantastic. And it's so, so needed in today's world. So listen, Tracy, thanks again very much. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. And I'll see all of you for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me, John.